Okay, my you're coming from the okay. So <laughs> I am from mean, the bank. <laughs> yes, yes. Back in it. What uh, division? What department? Health, nutrition, uh, and population. Okay. So you know, um, she's no longer there, but I think that's where she was. Um, oh, she's not in the order. Monica, that's the time. Of course, uh, yes, okay. yes, yes. And you are from. Uh, Oh, of course. <laughs> nice to meet you. to deliver some remarks sitting down? Or? I am going to present what we're doing in the Sahel. Mm -hmm. And we have a brand new project uh, on uh, Sahel uh, Women Empowerment. How, how long has the, this been uh, in operation? It's only been approved in December. We've oh. only kicked it off sometime in March. Mm -hmm. So it's brand new. considerate statements. <laughs> Try not. <laughs> Those are the ones that get you the questions. <laughs> Hi, Rich Hello. Sinkat is my name. Samuel nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Can I, let me
that yours? That's yours, okay. Mm. Perfect. All right, I think this is on. I hear my voice. Hello and welcome everybody to the uh, afternoon session. Um, realizing the power of youth, women, and families. Um, and thanks for the Wilson Center for putting this on and inviting me and, and this uh, incredibly interesting panel. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I feel like this is where we can start to see a roadmap for the future of the Sahel that looks a lot better than the, uh, the future that is laid out on the current trajectory uh, of, of the Sahel, um, which sometimes uh, to be perfectly honest, seems like this unsolvable puzzle. Uh, I personally came to this issue as a, as a journalist, um, covering the intersections of complex global environmental and social problems. Um, that's kind of where I've, where I've landed. I've reported from more than 19 different countries, mainly writing about climate change for shows like PRI's The World and PBS NewsHour, uh, and by increasingly so by spearheading year-long grant-funded special reporting projects, um, like we, one we did a few years ago called Food for Nine Billion, uh, which looked at the challenge of feeding the world at a time of rapid environmental and social change. <clears throat> it's the next of these uh, special projects that has really focused my research on the Sahel and all of the issues that are playing out there, um, like the ones we're talking about here today. I'll soon be launching a new uh, year-long multi-platform, multimedia um, special project looking at climate-induced migration around the world. The Sahel will be very much a focus of that um, project as well, which will be um, PRI's The World will be involved in that um, as the radio outlet. It's a very interesting place to me. Um, it has some of the worst case future scenarios, uh, the beginnings of, of which are, are, are playing out in the headlines today in many ways. Um, but it isn't necessarily the, it's not necessarily this unsolvable puzzle um, I was mentioning earlier, but that's only if actions are, the right actions are taken today. And this is a key point, um, because if the people of the Sahel and the world address the challenges uh, the region is facing today, the second half of the century, uh, beginning in you know 2050, which is the, that that date we always throw out there. Um, a lot of stuff's going to happen in 2050. Uh, the second half of the century starts to look a lot different from the the bleak scenarios of of mass migration, famine, conflict. Uh, you name it, the list goes on. Um, and so, with that, I want to introduce you to the four panelists we have here today, um, who are going to help us solve, uh, or at the very least, demystify. <laughs> Um, this complex puzzle, um, both by understanding what needs to happen on the policy side, all the way down to the grassroots level, all of which are essential. Um, so I, I think, um, let me give a, a brief overview um, of, of uh, Rich and Parfait are going to give kind of the big picture, 30,000 foot view of, of what to expect given the converging trends of growth, demography, and inequality in the Sahel, and, and some of the paradoxes that lie there. Um, and then Samira and Sani are going to bring us down to kind of the ground level view of what we're actually seeing as these issues play out. Uh, we'll start out with um, Parfait, who I, 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 I got his name pronunciation perfect when I talked to him the first time. I will now mangle it because I'm speaking in front of people. But <laughs> <laughs> Parfait uh, Elandu uh, Inyega. Did I say it right, Parfait? You did mangle it. I did. <laughs> 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 and as predicted, I put a little pressure on. Uh, he's a professor of development and sociology at Cornell University, where his areas of teaching and research cover broad questions related to African development education, demographic change, and global inequality. And he's currently leading an international network of researchers studying the implications of contemporary demographic change in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Parfait, we'll, we'll kick it off with you, and then I'll introduce the rest of you before you, um, you give your 12-minute your uh, presentations. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, okay.
Okay, lightning doesn't strike twice. Uh, Sam had it perfectly when we were at lunch, but he just missed my name. I'm Parfe Elundu Eniege, uh, and I'm professor at Cornell. Uh, I'm from Cameroon, and it's a pleasure to be here to discuss a few ideas that I've been uh, trying to put together. Um, I am going to begin by situating my presentation uh, around the big theme of this uh, uh, meeting, which is about security. Uh, and this particular panel, which is about youth uh, and population, which is my area of expertise. So I try to uh, link population, youth, and security, um, and somehow bring them um, together. Now, these three themes have been in the news quite a bit, uh, and you would recognize some of the events that we've been uh, watching or listening to, Boko Haram um, um, last year and throughout but also um, these events in Burkina Faso that Ambassador actually uh, discussed uh, over lunch. Um, but also beyond the international sphere, you have this sort of security and violence concern across borders, either in the context of migrants uh, trying to move um, uh, north or even within the region and being not necessarily welcome. Uh, you also have the same situation um, within countries in the form of low-grade um, violence, uh, daily muggings, and security concerns of that nature. And so, as we try to make sense of these uh, concerns over security and violence, there are a set of explanations that we tend to resort to. Um, we've talked about the environmental pressure, we've talked about governance, we've talked about poverty, and we talked about population. And this is the last nexus that I'll try to expand. Typically, when we have discussed population as a concern, there was a tendency to emphasize Malthusian concern over rapid population growth or the size of the population growth. And I want to extend that argument to suggest that there's another mechanism by which population can matter, and it has to do with variation in demographic behavior and how it affects inequality and the repercussions of inequality end up affecting um, uh, security concerns. And this is an argument that I call uneven demographic dividend. And this is really the theme that I'm going to develop throughout the presentation. And so this is how it goes. Number one, um, if you begin to see class differences in demographic behavior, not just in fertility behavior, but also in other a set of uh, behavior having to do with marriage and family structure, that feeds into a lot of inequality among youth. Uh, this inequality trickle up um, from early childhood all the way to adolescence and the transition from school to work. And especially at the nexus of this transition uh, from school to work that it can actually trigger violence. And so this is really the chain that I'm going to work us through. There's a bigger slide, uh, a bigger pr uh, set of slides that's available. I'm just going to try to hit the main points along this chain. Now, and I'm going to work this chain in reverse order. First, I'm going to establish, sorry, uh, number one, that is the link between inequality and violence. Then I'm going to talk about the extent of inequality in Africa uh, to uh, stress the fact that it's actually under discussed. And finally, I'm going to look at the effect of population change on inequality. So I'm going to look at these three points uh, in, um, in that order. Let's begin with the first. That is the nexus between inequality and violence. Uh, and I'm going to be brief here just to say that this is a link that is plausible in theory, whether you think about economic theories of, 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 of crime or sociological theories uh, uh, dealing with how inequality affects community participation or social trust, you, there's the expectation, at least in theory, that inequality, great, uh, large inequality should lead to violence. But in practice, this is a, a relationship that is very hard to test empirically and convincingly. Uh, you can always have um, studies like this that do macro correlation between inequality and violence, and indeed they find um, uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, pattern in which the greater the inequality in a country, the greater the amount of uh, violence. But it's not going to be a universal. This is a relationship that is likely to be highly contingent. It's going to depend on the um, level of uh, analysis that you are discussing. Uh, it's going to depend on the amount, the level of inequality, whether you have extreme inequality. 
is going to depend on whether inequality is associated with opportunity uh, or not, um, and so forth. So it's not a, a straightforward universal case. But nonetheless, we are going to proceed with the assumption that at least from a theoretical standpoint, this is a plausible relationship, that inequality is like likely to contribute to violence. Okay, so that's the first link. The second link which I'm touching is the extent of inequality. Again, I have many slides on this um, particular uh, topic. But what I just want to point out is three facts. First of all, inequality is high in Africa. Uh, this is a fact that is not often acknowledged. In 2012, there was a study that uh, mapped global inequality and one of these maps compared all the countries in the world against the U.S., and if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, including uh, the Sahel region, you found that many countries in Africa had higher levels of inequality than the U.S. at a time when the U.S. was at its own historical high. And so that's quite impressive. Not only this, uh, if you take the top 10 uh, most unequal countries in the world, typically in those rankings you routinely have five to six countries coming from Africa. They're not from the West African region, they tend to come from the South or uh, the Central region, but nonetheless uh, the Sahel is not immune to inequality. So that's something that is not um, uh, often acknowledged. One thing that is al also not acknowledged is that if you look be at inequality between countries in Africa, that is how much uh, countries vary or are diverse in terms of the economic um, um, uh, position, uh, the inequality, economic inequality between African countries has been rising since 1990. So there's an upward trend in inequality between countries. Third, inequality is not confined to inequality in incomes. It also affects substantive outcomes such as health and schooling. So inequality is high in Africa, in some cases is increasing, and is something that is not often discussed. Now, there are many reasons why it's not often discussed. Um, I have a detailed discussion of these reasons. Maybe they, it's, it's a competition with the dominant paradigm of poverty, maybe the, ex uh, the expectation that at least some of the inequality is inevitable or that it's going to be short-lived, etc. But the most important reason that I want to emphasize here is that typically when we think about inequality, we think about inequality for the entire population rather than inequality for some subsections of the population, for instance, inequality among youth in particular. How do youth, different youth compare amongst themselves? And yet, if we really want to understand the link between inequality and violence, it makes sense to pay attention to the specific inequality that you have among youth for, for at least three reasons. The first is that, well, there's um, a, a clear age pattern of violence that has been documented in many countries. So the levels of participation in violence at both ends of the, the, the equation tend to be higher here in the adult groups. And so if inequality is, 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 it matters for violence, this is where it's going to matter most. And so we ought to pay attention to this gray zone here. Second is uh, inequality matters in terms of reference groups. Um, um, uh, it's about keeping up with the Jonases. Okay, a 20-year-old person is not going to bemoan a 60-year-old person for having a house and a car. On the other hand, they're going to feel less comfortable if all of their peers are uh, better off than they are. And so we need to pay attention to group-specific inequality as, as opposed to generalized um, notion of inequality. Okay. And so having said this, uh, inequality matters. It's important, but it's under-discussed. The last point that I want to develop is the third, which is the link between demographic change and inequality, and here this is the main argument uh, that I call <coughs> the uneven, uneven demographic dividend. What I mean by this is that, well, class differences in demographic behavior translate into inequality among children, and these inequalities work their way through up adulthood and so forth. Okay, and so that I'm going, to, I'm going to just give you a little bit of detail on that particular notion. Now, the thesis that I build here is a spin off, uh, it spins off the notion of the demographic dividend, which is represented here, which is the notion that, well, as 
uh, a country's birth rate goes down. You have a transformation in age structure, and then this transformation in age structure and, and, and a reduction in dependency ratio makes it possible to increase savings and investment and ultimately stimulates economic growth. Okay, so that's a, a, ten, a tenable argument, but I modify it uh, on three key points. First point is that I say that the end product is not just growth. It can be also about inequality. Um, uh, the second point is that we need to make a clear distinction between age dependency and economic dependency. Just because somebody turns 15 or 16 or because they turn 21 does not depend that doesn't mean that they leave the ranks of the dependent. They need to find a job before they become actually a support. And the third point is that <coughs> the only um, demographic behavior that matters is not just aggregate fertility decline. Rather, we ought to pay attention to the distribution of fertility in the population, but also all other changes in demographic behavior, including marriage, family structure, and so forth. And so if you consider all this, uh, you can understand how um, differences in demographic behavior are going to lead to uh, inequality among youth. And so this is a simple equation that we can all relate to here. From a resource dilution perspective, the resources that a child is going to have are going to depend primarily on three factors. Number one, they're going to depend on the family income. Number two, they're going to depend on the family propensity to invest in children in general. And number three, they are going to depend on the number of children that they have to take care of. And so if you have inequality in either one of these factors here, you're going to have growing inequality among children. And so what I argue is that many demographic variables affect inequality in either income, propensity to invest in children, or the number of dependents that they have. And some of these um, uh, demographic behaviors are listed here, and I'm going to just uh, to showcase the ones that are in red uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so if we take fertility behavior, for instance, Okay, I have I show here data for several Sahel countries, um, and in each country, I show the birth rate uh, uh, separated by class from the lower socioeconomic group to the higher socioeconomic group. And to simplify this, I put a ratio of the bottom to the top group, which is an indicator of the inequality that you have in that particular country in terms of birth rate. Okay, the bigger the number, the bigger the inequality. And I have separated the countries that have high fertility here, higher fertility here, and the countries that have slightly lower fertility here. And so if you compare roughly the two groups, you can see that you have bigger numbers here at the bottom compared to the top. Meaning that as the countries go through their demographic transition, certainly the birth rate goes down. But what also happens is that you start having class differences in demographic behavior. <laughs> and those class differences in demographic behavior are going to uh, uh, feed into inequality. The same thing holds true if you look at a factor that Ambassador just talked about, which is maternal c control or domestic resources. Essentially, the question here is, what is, um, what is the percentage of women who control decision-making over large purchases? Okay? And you do the same analysis. Um, bigger numbers represent greater amount of inequality. And um, here you compare countries with higher birth rates and low bir lower birth rates. And you can see here that even as these countries sort of reduce their birth rate, you have increasing differentiation between the rich and the poor in the extent to which women control um, uh, the resources. And so that is going to also affect the inequality in the extent to which uh, in the resources that children have. Okay. Third and final point on this count here, uh, the same is true with teenage motherhood. Teenage motherhood ex uh, affects other outcomes later in life, the extent to which you can have uh, formal employment and so forth. And if you do the same analysis, you have the same result essentially. As countries advance in their demographic transition, sure, the birth rates go down, but they also become more unequal. And this is going to affect inequality among children. Okay, so that's the bottom line. A wide host of demographic behaviors shape inequality in the resources that children are going to have. And ultimately, these inequalities are going to work themselves through the life cycle. Okay, first in childhood, they're going to affect child survival, inequality in child survival. They're going to affect inequality in schooling. 
And most importantly for this um, group here, they're going to affect inequality in the transition from school to work. And so inequality in the extent to which um, the young adults are going to remain unemployed after they leave school. And that is one of the contributors, in my estimation, to the violence, the different kinds of violence that we have talked about here. Okay. So in summary, the argument of an uneven demographic dividend is a slight corrective to the argument of a demographic dividend. When we talk about the demographic dividend, we expect countries in the Sahel and other African countries to boost their economic growth as their fertility goes down. And that can happen, in fact, is happening already in some, we see first signs of this happening in a few countries. But at the same time, we have to be um, concerned about the inequality that is going to accompany this process and the implication that this is going to have for violence. And so this is the challenge. Um, that is, we likely to have growth in inequality. There are a few su uh, suggestions here that I have proposed, not that I have proposed, that I have really compiled. There's a fair amount of work that has been done on how to address this uh, uh, youth unemployment and inequality in youth unemployment. And so this is the standard um, stuff. I have added a few ideas here that expand beyond the marketplace because the transition into adulthood is, is, is more than just getting a job. But more importantly, there's an element that I haven't included here because as you recall, um, the, uh, a lot of these inequalities have to do with demographic behavior. And so to what extent, to the extent that we can act on some of these um, drivers of inequality in resource endowment of children, we can begin to slightly correct the inequalities that are going to work themselves through the life cycle. And uh, with this, I'm going to stop. Thank you so much, Parfait. And I, and I think we can you know, even get into some of the, the solutions aspect of this in the Q&A, too, because that's um, we didn't have much time for that. So, <laughs> um, But it's fascinating how, how these inequalities can mm -hmm. kind of create this domino effect uh, into other inequalities um, and then leading to violence. I mean, it's something I, I hadn't thought about. So it's um, really interesting work you're doing. Um, next, we have Richard uh, Sincata. I pronounced that right, right? That's right. <laughs> Global fellow at the Wilson <laughs> Center and demographer in residence at the Stim Stimson Center. Uh, his current research focuses on the political effects of the demographic and age structural transitions, as well as their associations with political stability, civil conflict, uh, income growth, and natural resource dynamics. Uh, you can find some of his work on these topics published in Foreign Policy, Current History, Nature, and Science. Um, with that, Rich, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, and, you Sam. Uh, looking forward to hearing this. Well, good afternoon, and I'll, <coughs> I'll try to be quick about this. Um, but be sure to cut me off when I... <laughs> I will. I by, uh, anyway. um, my focus here is, uh, is going to be on... Let's see how to advance that. Got it. Okay. My focus is on a, a, a wider interpretation of the Sahel. The Sahel, uh, as has been shown before in slides, <clears throat> extends across Africa. It intersected, uh, in 1975, it intersected nine states. Those nine states have become 11 states. And there's concerns, of course, uh, that there may be further breakups <laughs> among these states. The data I'll be using. Uh, are from the UN Population Division, uh, Freedom House, and uh, uh, the uh, Uppsala and, and uh, PRIO data sets, if you're familiar with those. Uh, when I talk about uh, liberal democracy, I'm talking about free and Freedom House's scoring system. I'll talk about partial democracies, which is partly free and not free, in Freedom House's uh, survey is, is uh, generally considers autocracies. <clears throat> and when the ambassador, uh, Ambassador Williamson, talked about uh, democracies in Niger and, uh, in, and in Mali, uh, at least in the latest, their latest, uh, uh, their, their current conditions, she's talking about what Freedom House would call a partial democracy, that is, uh, with voting rights, but maybe short on civil rights. What we think of <coughs> in, uh, as a, a liberal democracy would be Senegal which is in the region. 
So uh, what I'm going to make the point is that, it's, it, that if you're in the Sahel, this region, it's tough to be a state. Right? They, of course, they are states. But <clears throat> it's tough to be a state in the way that some citizens would like, or the international community would like. And there's many reasons for this. First of all, deep ethno-linguistic and ethno-religious uh, cleavages, uh, differences and tensions between livelihoods, a significant portion of the population that's transhuman, uh, borders that were set uh, as are remnants of colonial, uh, European colonialism, uh, extraordinary rapid, rapidly pop, uh, growing populations in cities, and, uh, and dwindling per capita levels of renewable resources. Of course, we've talked about those, people have addressed them. What I'm going to talk about is political demographers' interpretation of what may be, uh, what may also contribute to this difficulty in providing the services, uh, creating unity, uh, and um, and becoming a modern nation state. And to do that, what we're going to do is look at uh, a graph that depicts uh, the age structure of populations. On the bottom of this graph is, uh, is the percent of seniors, 65 and older. Uh, on this vertical axis are those who are, uh, are uh, uh, younger than 30. And as you can see, countries are moving down through this transition as, as fertility declines and as the A structure changes, there's changes, geometric changes in the distribution of the populations. And those populations, as they're configured, become, uh, is, is what happens, is, is commonly called aging, and it's those changes that create the demographic dividend. Uh, and it's argued that, uh, what I'm going to argue is that uh, uh, those have to be, those are correlated, at least in some way, with, uh, with changes in the risk of conflict and the risk of becoming a liberal democracy that is getting to very high levels of democracy. So if we move to the, <coughs> the, uh, this slide, unfortunately, you can't, I don't know if you can see that they were read on my computer, but up on the top here are actually the, uh, the Sahelian countries that I've depicted. So there, there's a cluster that, uh, that are s uh, right about here, and you'll see that actually they're all within this, um, this segment of this graph uh, that are associated with, uh, with conflict. 80% of all new conflict begins here in that square, and it has since the 1970s. And 15 to 20% of these countries are assessed as liberal democracies, but those democracies are typically unstable, and we'll I'll hope to illustrate that. If we move down here in the transition, the age structural transition, you come across the, an intermediate category where roughly about 50% of all uh, countries have reached that very high level of, of uh, democracy that, uh, that uh, a political scientists typically call liberal democracy and free and freedom houses uh, uh, scoring system. And if we move further, we're down to an area where there is about 80% of all uh, countries are liberal democracies. Over here are some stragglers. Those are the uh, uh, Gulf cooperation states that uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, what I do with those is strip off all the migrants. They, they look younger than they are because of, I'm sorry, they look older than they are because they, they, are, uh, uh, they contain a lot of labor migrants. And so I strip them off, put them back up there where they should be, which is in the youthful population group. Uh, down in the, this fourth quadrant, there should be some day, very soon coming, uh, older countries. And we know nothing about those. Well, I'm going to be using our data uh, that's already established. And that data, if you go back 40 years, uh, you create this, um, this function that uh, describes the ascent to liberal democracy uh, among, uh, among states. So what we can see is that, uh, that uh, Here's the median age on the median age on the bottom axis. On the on the uh, vertical axis is uh, the probability of being free. And uh, instead of looking at historic time, which is which uh, 
in which one finds uh, countries rising to liberal democracy and losing them in a fairly chaotic pattern. Instead, we have a very ordered pattern uh, that uh, looks like a, a logistic curve or an S-curve, where the 50% pr probability point is right about uh, 29 years of median age. Now, disaggregating this, um, we find uh, that uh, there are other factors. This isn't the only factor, and this factor is, uh, is quite complex, actually. And, but uh, other factors like uh, the size of the population, if the population is small, uh, there are more liberal democracies than one would expect. And, uh, and there's a number of factors, regime factors, that I won't go into uh, right in this presentation, um, but other factors uh, like conflict that, uh, that push, uh, that actually create fewer uh, liberal democracies than you would expect. If you disaggregate this into gains and losses, when, uh, and still using this, this age structural uh, 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 horizontal axis, you see that what happens here is that, that countries can gain free, that is, they can become liberal democracies when they're very youthful, but they have a high probability of losing free. A story that repeats over and over in Latin America and in the Sahel and West Africa. Once they're past this median age of about uh, 26, well, then the probability gains that they'll be able to keep that, that, uh, that rating. Now, all the countries in the Sahel are in this youthful group. In fact, their, their median ages are all under 20. And in the next uh, 20 years, the next two decades, uh, they still will not escape this, this level. So their likelihood of many of them reaching very high levels of democracy uh, are low, actually. Now, here's, uh, this, this graph shows the difference between when uh, countries that are sort of past that intersection point, or intermediate uh, age structures, and those are youthful. This gives you a, a sort of uh, mortality curve for liberal democracies, that if you line them up at a at beginning point T, and uh, let them advance together, uh, youthful countries are, lose liberal democracies at quite a rapid rate, uh, and half of them, more than half of them, are gone in 10 years. And, and that has been the, the case for West Africa. So what I'm going to do is take you through uh, some of uh, West Africa's history uh, with data. And these, uh, these explosions here are conflicts. Uh, Conflicts that are either low intensity, high intensity. Uh, they, not, they don't go on for the whole decade necessarily, but they did occur during this decade. Many of them are very intermittent. Um, and this F means that uh, it reached the level of free. So as you can see in 1972 to 1979, uh, Nigeria uh, reached that high level. And um, by, uh, actually, I'm not, there it is. I'm sorry, I pushed back. Burkina Faso was there as well. Uh, but by the end of the decade, it had disappeared. Uh, 1980, 1989, uh, Nigeria still uh, recognizes free, but slides off the scale uh, and to very low levels of, liberal, uh, of, uh, of regime scores, of uh, freedom scores. By that point, uh, 1990 to 99, uh, Mali shows up on the map as, as uh, free. But as you can see, by this time, conflict extends well across the Sahel. And, uh, and uh, liberal democracies are popping up other places in, in, in West Africa, outside the Sahel, in Benin, Ghana, where they persist. Quite, uh, also, they did in, um, for a time in, in Gambia and they, may, uh, they stay that way in, uh, in Cape Verde, a very resi resilient demography, uh, democracy in a, in a small country. Um, by uh, 2000, uh, Mali is left, 
And by uh, 2010 to 2015, it's Mali and Senegal. And, uh, and Senegal remains the only liberal democracy. So you can see how the model works in this case that, uh, in fact, uh, democracy, high levels of democracy are possible. Uh, maintaining them is, is a difficult proposition at, at age structures like this for many reasons. What happens in 2030? Is it a clean slate? Could anything happen? Well, it could, but there's, a, there's sort of a legacy here of, um, of, this, uh, of this, uh, these age structures that are high and all the associated uh, issues that go with them. Um, you can see uh, here's the model's expectancy uh, for expected level of free, and that's exactly how uh, uh, the number of uh, liberal democracies panned out from 72 to 80, that you had zero to one uh, until you're left with one Senegal at the end. Uh, authoritarian regimes declined, partial democracies increased. Um, pretty much as one would expect uh, with a collection of countries like that, of uh, that size. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll end with this slide, which actually looks a little bit into the future with some more age structural models. It's possible to do the same thing uh, with uh, interstate conflict. Here's uh, Freedom House's free score. Also, the, the uh, World Bank's high middle income category. And here again is that youthful segment of the uh, of, of age, age structures, which the Sahelian countries are unlikely to leave by 2030. Uh, even the low projection of uh, the UN's low projection finds them well within this uh, uh, this region. So, what lies in the future? Well, that's up to those countries. Uh, there's a uh, even though the, the, the likelihood is uh, against them of, of, of being, escaping the cycle of violence and during this short period, um, there's hope with, uh, with development, uh, getting, th getting through the, age uh, the, the demographic transition and moving through the age structural transition is, is an important and necessary step. And, and as we've heard, uh, women be are a part, a large part of that step. And, it cannot, and their, uh, their advancement cannot be avoided at, at any kind of time. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll end, mm -hmm. Sam. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Rich. That was really fascinating. Um, and, and you transitioned uh, perfectly into our next speaker, um, Samira uh, al Um Hopefully I'm getting these names right. Um, Samir is a, a senior advisor for the World Bank's uh, Sahel Women's Empowerment and Demographic Dividend Project. She's also a board certified OBGYN uh, with more than 15 years of clinical practice. Uh, she has also just returned from posting at the first regional as the first regional director of Arab States for UN Women based in Cairo. Um, really looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, and it's really good to be here. Um, the, um, my presentation is going to be uh, about a project that the bank is doing in the Sahel, Sahel. And you would notice that every time the word Sahel comes up, I involuntarily pronounce it as Sahel. Sahel is an Arabic word that means coast. So um, it's very difficult for me to replace my own native word with something else, what, no matter what that something else is. Um, the, um, the beauty also of speaking almost last is that everybody had, had done what you wanted to do. So um, apart from that, uh, I think I am not going to focus very much on why the bank is doing what it is doing, but rather on what is the bank doing. I am not going to get into the um, into the definitions of the demographic dividend, et cetera, et cetera, what have you. 
I came back from UN Women to this project. I almost landed into it because this was approved in December of 2014. And this, I was told historically, uh, I've been in and out of the bank a few times, would be the biggest commitment that a financial institution like the bank would have given to uh, women issues, um, be it reproductive health, maternal, neonatal, child, adolescent health and what have you. But the project has many other components that are truly interesting and they interwined and depart from the women agenda to converge as, as well on the women agenda. So if, uh, if executed the way it was envisioned, I think it's going to be of benefit to the, uh, to the region. Um, I am going to quickly uh, tell you about the key features of the project and the background, why, why it came to be what it is, and then some of the project components. Uh, um, in November 2013, there was a call for, uh, for the importance of what is, uh, what's happening in the Sahel countries. Uh, uh, President uh, Isufo called for an action to improve women's reproductive health and girls' education in those countries, uh, and also as a mean to benefit uh, from the economic, uh, uh, the economic potential of the demographic dividend. This was met by a very positive response from the UN Secretary General and the President of the World Bank. The project currently covers five countries. Um, we are actually, we've just concluded an aid memoir with Burkina Faso, so it's, going, it's actually six countries. That's Chad, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. Uh, the total IDA amount, IDA is the International uh, Development uh, uh, Aid, uh, at, at 170.2 uh, million with Burkina Faso, it's going to be 2.205 million. And the project uh, aims at increase women and adolescents' girls' empowerment and their access to reproductive child and maternal health services that are of a quality to be used, and to improve the regional knowledge generation and sharing as well as regional capacity and coordination. And this comes back from the idea, um, which is not new, but the Global South you know, the South-to-South -South cooperation and leaving behind the residual knowledge and, and centers of excellences rather than, uh, you know, coming in and the things are good as long as one is there and one, once you leave, uh, things go back to what they were. Um, and a, a question that I decided to put up uh, because we get asked about this every time we brief a group on the um, Sahel um, uh, demographic dividend project is why a regional approach and I, th I think it's the answer is straightforward is uh, to benefit from the cost effectiveness uh, of solutions to bottlenecks that are collectively faced by the beneficiaries the country that are benefiting from the project uh, to generate and share regional knowledge to set up regional mechanisms and also um, benefiting from uh, scale economies, those that actually do make it to a scale economy. Uh, specifically, we're talking about the reproductive health, commodity security, and the supply chain, and a regional procurement mechanism to up obtain lower prices for most most of the of the health products. I mean, the the, the products that are used for within the uh, reproductive health, commodity security chains, and the supply chain. Uh, it aims also at the creating two regional centers of reference for pooling resources to train high quality midwifery faculty and uh, it's not something that we've invented or we discovered but I think most of the literature points out to scarce resources when it comes to human resources for health and as uh, rural as you go the, these, these resources become less and less not only in the number of people who are willing to reside in, uh, in those areas and serve those population but also in the, in the um, quality of their education and not only quality of their basic education but the quality of their continuous education skills that they gain as they are they are doing what they are doing um, the project was designed to rely heavily on partners um, some of our regional partners uh, are WAHO the West African Health Organization uh, and um, uh, the CRPOD which is part of another um, body uh, being uh, that's going to be in charge of the support of the capacity building on population analysis UNFPA also is a very integral partner that's the West African office um, 
some of the international partners, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave us um, uh, seed funding to actually uh, prepare the project and to help no, uh, launch it. Uh, and WHO would uh, would provide some of the technical support, especially on the component of the work of the health workforce. I am not going to go into this, especially after the um, the presentation by Perfi and other and and uh, and Richard. Uh, but it's just a quick note to say that the. Um, uh, the change in the age, age structure can lead to economic uh, boost if, if actually used the way it should be. Um, the, all the countries in the Sahel could benefit from a demographic dividend provided that the right policies are put in place and put in place urgently. And um, the, uh, at, the, at the risk of reiterating what was already said, uh, the rapid fertility decline has to be also met by, by, um, by uh, 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 the economic gains uh, and by the right policies. And so far, the fertility decline in Sahel countries is very slow, and the graph is showing what's happening in the six or the seven countries uh, that are beneficiaries compared to Latin America, Caribbean, and South, uh, and South Asia. Now, in the contraceptive prevalence uh, uh, rate remains low in the Sahel countries. In the five tar targeted countries, uh, they have the lowest contraceptive prevalence rate, and unsurprisingly as well, the highest fertility rates, including among girls, that's, that's adolescent girls. And this also, of course, contributes to their high maternal mortality ratios because it's, it's an exposure issue, if nothing less. So this, um, this table shows the total fertility rate <coughs> impacted by the adolescent fertility rate, the contraceptive prevalence rate, uh, that's the modern methods, and then the maternal mortality ratio. And I need not to go into the details because the numbers speak for themselves. Um, the, um, the, the, the project has um, three components. The first one is to increase the demand for reproductive health uh, services, mainly through women's and girls' empowerment. And the word empowerment has many, many uh, sub-components underneath it. And uh, to create demand, we need to, to meet it with supply. And that would be the second component, is to improve the supply of reproductive health services with more efficient procurement and better distribution of products and the improved quality and availability of quali qualified health workers. And the third component is to strengthen capacity and accountability of the governance structure of policy makers on population issues. Um, the demand remains low. Uh, the unmet need for contraception are rather low and even lower for birth limitation. And this speaks volumes for how much actually women in, in those countries know about their, their reproductive rights rather than the reproductive health in itself. And the low demand is driven by the low status of women and especially the low status of girls. The, the first component will address gender inequalities through a multi-sectoral approach. Through a regional call for proposals, we will fund, fund sub-projects on girls' education, on life skills, including literacy and business skills, social and behavioral change and communications, creating safe space for girls, um, husbands' schools, clerics run communications, and so on and so forth. And these sub-projects will be part of a rigorous regional evaluation as to generate a badly needed evidence on what works in women and girls' empowerment and what doesn't. The second component will improve the supply of quality products for reproductive health services. Um, there is actually a well-documented heavy transaction cost for procuring reproductive health products, probably all health products, but since we're focusing on reproductive health. So the project will try and support the setup of a regional pooled procurement me mechanism for these products. And the other bottleneck that um, was uh, identified through, uh, do, during our preliminary research is the weakness of the last mile delivery segment of the supply chain. I mean, the, the products could, could arrive at a capital city or at a major city or even a big town, but it is that rural area, that mountainous place, that health center that does not really service a lot of population, which we call the last mile delivery. And the, the project will support a regional cooperation between countries to test and replicate the approaches that are successful for improving the last delivery. And I just put out some examples like the, inform, the informed push model currently piloted in Senegal, Togo, and Burkina Faso, and it's part of one of the bank projects. 
The rural pipeline approach will also improve the quality and availability of qualified health workers. That's the second component. The, uh, the project will support the regional rollout of a rural pipeline, which includes focus on students and health workers in rural background, with rural backgrounds, and the decentralization the decentralization of recruitment and deployment policies and the whole system of incentives so people can stay where they are. And then we're also aiming at creating two regional centers for excellence in midwifery training and hopefully retention. The last component is to strengthen the capacity and accountability of politicians and policy makers regarding population issues. And um, the, uh, the accountability is on the dem demographic dividend, and the project will set up a regional forum for policy makers, civil society, religious leaders to discuss population issues and monitor government budgets. And th the religious leaders is something that's really very um, important in some of the cultural settings of those countries. Um, because it doesn't really matter what you do, it doesn't really matter how much you raise the demand and meet it with supply and there is an intact supply chain. If the religious leader says that you sin if you take pills, then no one is going to take the pills and that's from experience. The second component of this is, the, um, in, is a, to increase the capacity of policy makers um, through the creation of a regional network of observatories for the demographic dividend um, so as these these bodies would would be engaged in the collection analysis comparison reporting uh, on the data and population and gender issues at it uh, as it evolves thank you Thanks so much, Samira. That was that was um, fascinating. I, I was recently in Malawi and I saw firsthand how um, the religious, you know, having the religious leaders on board for these um, family planning programs is is so essential. And and even um, where I saw an imam there who had actually taken a leadership role in promoting it um, and and had really enabled this transformation on the community level that wouldn't have been possible without his support. So that's um, very interesting. Um, now we come to our, our final panelist, um, uh, Thank you. Um, Sani Ayuba uh, is the General Secretary of Niger's National Platform on Climate Change and Sustainable Development, correct? Um, he's also the founder and director of Young Volunteers for the Environment uh, in Niger. I'm pronouncing it with the, I mean, I'm saying it in English, it's actually the, uh, the French, um, um, I should be saying it in French, but I'm not going to. Uh, in that role, uh, he, is, he travels into rural communities in Niger, raising awareness on issues related to uh, the environment and sustainable development. Um, and so uh, with Sani, I think we'll, he we'll hear much more of an on-the-ground um, observation of, of how these issues are playing out um, in Niger and in the, in the Sahel. Thanks, Sani. Okay, thank you. Like you said, my, my name is Sani Ayuba. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk on this issue as young because in my country it's sometimes not easy as young to talk about young is issues also. We are, we are always absent sometimes when people talk about young. So I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank uh, the Wilson Center for organizing this, uh, these uh, conferences. So my presentation is just about to show and to share our work with community at a uh, national level and also the work that we did at young, young leaders in our country. Because I'm also part of uh, uh, this program of President Obama that called uh, Young Leader Initiative, uh, African Young Leader Initiative. So I'm part of this program called YALI. So I'm also a member of the National Youth Council. So that's why we talk to, we try to involve young people on every issues we talk to involved in the process of de development. So my presentation is just about some picture here. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to develop three, three kind of projects that we have uh, with young people in my country. Mm -hmm. So the first one is about entrepreneurship because uh, in, in, in Sahel in general in, in Africa, when we talk about young people, we try to see the first problem that we are facing is the problem of employment. So how as young we can resolve this problem or how can we accelerate youth empowerment uh, by promoting entrepreneurial. So as a member of the National Youth Council, 
Oh, you talk with uh, OEF. OEF is the Francophone uh, Space Organization and uh, the state of Niger, the government of Niger, to have uh, the International Forum on Youth and Green Business. So this forum tries to help young people with entrepreneurial idea to develop their project and facilitate access to finance because you have many young people that have idea to do some to start a small business, but, but they don't have the means or the money or also uh, the capacity to build. So this forum gathered together around two, 300 people from youth from the Francophonie Espace, Espace in Niger. So the project should promote the creation of green job that's offer many alternatives to solve the employment problem. Because um, actually when we see uh, the problem that we are facing, uh, uh, the economic in Sahel or in Niger in particular yeah, is based on agriculture and also animal husbandry. But when you see, uh, according to the climate change issue and also the lack of information, many young people uh, leave this kind of activities and by migrate to uh, urban area or to travel in another country. So this project try to involve them to stay in their community and start uh, some small business. So at the end of this forum, uh, the best project were selected for funding and will be followed by an incubator. Because in also in the kind, uh, after the in the recommendation of the, the forum, uh, people decide young people decided to have an incubator in Niger that try to help you people to start their their business, and also uh, my organization are very involved in uh, in this program uh, by creating by facilitating the participation of several young people, and also we propose a pilot project on smart agriculture. How can we, you, you, we involve young people in encour by encouraging them to embrace agriculture and farming? Because actually when we see uh, young people try to see that uh, agriculture is something that is traditional thing and also is for elder people. So young people live this kind, they want to be stay in office and to work uh, at the city. So for us, uh, I think uh, the large part of our population are coming from rural area. So we try to involve them in this kind of activities. And also, as part of the, this program, the African Young Leaders Initiative, we try to, to involve young people by leading a, young, a caravan on peace and security. Because actually, when uh, you see the style, uh, some guys talking about uh, the problem of uh, security and Boko Haram also. So I think uh, the problem is about extremism violence. So how can we as young leader or a representative for young, how can we be involved in this kind of situation? So because in the past year we are talking about the prevention, but now we are not uh, in the prevention because since last month Boko Haram attacked some, some position in Niger and also we are facing some, uh, some conflicts. So I know uh, that is, is now the time for us to see how can we contribute to manage those kind of conflicts. So we lead this caravan with the uh, U.S. Embassy that we call a Caravan National on Peace and Security. So we, we, ac we travel across uh, all the eight regions in Niger to gather young people together and try to give them some sensation and also to hear about them. Because the thing that I say in our country is not sometimes young people are not, don't have this possibility to, to see, to, to raise their voice, and uh, people refuse to hear of, of them. They say you are too young to be here or you are too young to be associated in some kind, in this kind of issue. But I think uh, the development issue is a, a, a thing that concerns everybody. That it's not because you are young or you are a woman that you can't be involved in. So also I want uh, I want to highlight something because uh, the use of internet because uh, actually when uh, when we see uh, the extremism uh, uh, the extremism group are now to use the internet to spread extremism message and attract a vast audience there be recruiting young people because actually according to the new technology you have uh, every many young people as teenager that are in this platform so I think it can be a great idea to see how we can use positively this social media in order to sensitize them, to award them, <coughs> and also how, how young people can easily fall prey as they are often driven by the desert to connect, to be engaged. How can they be involved? How can we use the social media in order to change the mentality, in order to involve them to denounce to do, uh, some other, uh, terrorist messages or some radicalization. 
and also in this we should also trying to reflect how the family which kind of role the families can play because we know in Africa generally families can play central role in the prevention of extremist radicalization of the youth and also we think that family can can be used as effective tools in identifying early warning signs of radicalization uh, so in our work with uh, USAID through uh, via the, the program Peace Tool of Development we try to see uh, which also is a program that the young volley is uh, led by search for common ground we try to have some youth group uh, can, that can be young, uh, young facilitator and um, or moderator mediator on peace issues and also how can we develop a youth leadership in this kind of issues so uh, that's the work that we did in, in peace uh, sector also. And also women, how can we involve, because uh, we think that women especially are strategically placed in their role as mother and caregivers, so to be the first to notice signs of radicalization. Because in our context, in, it's not easy to see if you are in a family, one of member of the family, when she, he did some bad things people are not care about, or they refuse to denounce them because they say uh, it's things that happen in the family so they can stay in the family. So I think it's this kind of uh, message that we're supposed to change it. And so talking about uh, our one program that we have with women, is uh, the program called Project Energy, Poverty and Gender in Agro-Processing. It's a program that uh, my organization, JVE, Jeune Volontaire pour l'Environnement, is involved as a local capacity builder. It is a, a program with uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, Development Organization, and that based in Niger, but my organization is uh, hired uh, as a local capacity builder. So this program uh, tried to adopt and promote the rice husk in lieu of traditional cooking furnace, made up tree brick that use a lot of wood. Because we are in the Sahel, so if people, uh, women still using wood for cooking, that's uh, in the next year, next few years, we can have any, any trees in our country. So cooking wood is also expensive and cutting, cutting it in the first place deteriorate the environment. So, but the rice agriculture residue can be used as fuel and a replacement of the cooking wood. Uh, this project uh, we started last year in s seven localities that have with uh, that have a high production of rice. So, uh, in at the end of the project, uh, the, uh, we we think that is an innovative project that contribute to increasing the economic power of women and reduce poverty because uh, the rice husk is free is not uh, like uh, the wood because the wood uh, every woman can pay three three hundred uh, three hundred CFIs mean uh, like five dollar by week for three for, for wood for cooking so but this uh, rice husk is free so we increase the economic power of women and reduce poverty energy is now free women no longer have to pay for cooking wood the rice husk also helps in combating deforestation and reduce the effect of climate change uh, and also this program improving women's health as they now cook in a smoke free environment so this is some picture of uh, uh, this cooking uh, cooking stuff that we have that try to help women and also we have uh, some mystical involvement because since last week before coming here according to the activities that we done in last year in some rural commune some some uh, this is the mayor of one commune that he come to buy uh, 176 uh, cooking stuff for the uh, householder in in his village so i think this is a good uh, initiative and we work also with uh, uh, local authorities to see how can we sensitize people to to live this kind of uh, 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 cooking stuff cooking stuff that use wood by using this new one the gap and opportunity for me i think they need and support to have a youth entrepreneurial fund and also how can we involve youth in sustainable agriculture thank you very much thank you so much sunny um, always interesting to see how these moves into sustainable uh, technologies, whatever they may be, um, have, have, can have these ripple effects on, you know, empowering women uh, socially, uh, economically. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Um, we're going to go move on to the, the question and answer section of this panel. 
Um, and I would love to uh, just kick off the, the Q&A with um, a question of my own, which is um, looking at these, looking at how these, these issues are playing out in the Sahel, I'm just, I'm curious about, um, are there other parts of the world that, um, that have similar circumstances or had similar circumstances that have played out um, that uh, the Sahel, Sahel could learn from um, these initiatives, past, present, um, from other, other parts of the world? That would be um, one of the first questions I have. Um, I'm going to throw out a few, and then we'll, we'll um, you guys can, can step in and answer some of them. Um, if so, um, you know, what's, what would, you know, if, if there are some other initiatives um, that could serve as models, you know, what are they, um, and um, what would they look like as you apply them to the Sahel region and the unique set of circumstances there? Um, and Sonny, as you were speaking, I wanted to, um, I wanted to throw out, because often we, we see, the, you know, in these, in these youth bulges, um, men, you know, the young men are seen as kind of the catalyst for conflict. A lot of the focus becomes on empowering women, which is very important. Um, I'm curious, you know, you're, you're going through these areas, you're talking to young men, young men and women, um, you know, on the, on the young male side, as far as, um, as far as, uh, you know, efforts that can be done to, to kind of steer men um, down a different path um, and, and even become, you know, the youth, the young men would be more, you know, to, to, to have them be the generation that's much more accepting of reproductive health, um, you know, delaying onset of marriage, girls staying in school longer. I'd love to just hear some of the on-the-ground observations that you see um, as far as addressing those issues. So um, who would like to start out? Uh, Parfait, Rich, Samira, with the, the first one being being about the, um, the are, are there other regions of the world that have had or have similar problems that, that could serve as models for the Sahel? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think what, is, what, was, what we're seeing in the Sahel is not really unique to, to those countries. I think there were many repeated patterns with varying degrees of success to uh, actually with it, whether it is the demographic dividend or leaving women behind uh, the entire development agenda. Uh, I am an Arab and I lived and worked in the Arab region and the last time I worked in the Arab region was last December in, in while when I was posted in Cairo. And I think that um, there has to be a political commitment and a realization of the role of women into the entire development agenda rather than wait uh, for someone to say this document is gender blind. And this happens not just at the level of the governments, it happens at the level of the World Bank, it happens at the level of the United Nations, it happens all the time. There has to be a genuine, systematic and honest inclusion of, of both genders into whatever you are drafting, whether you're drafting a proposal for $500 or for $5 billion. It does not really matter. Um, I mean, um, taking women agenda into consideration cannot be an afterthought, and it cannot be a checklist as well. And we there is an ample evidence in the literature as to the fact that when women are economically empowered, they make better choices, not just for themselves, but for their families as well. They make better choices for the household, they make better choices for their kids, be it education, be it health, be it nutrition. Everything just sort of jumps up the scale rather than, with all due respect, of course, this is not a, not, this is not a battlefield. I'm just talking about how women are, are responsible fiscally rather than anything else. That's one thing. The other thing is that on the economic part, we are seeing more and more female-headed households simply because of all those conflicts. I mean, the conflicts that are raging in Africa are not worse than the conflicts that are raging in the Middle East. Syria lost, what, one-third of its population because of, uh, of the five years' war, and now we are seeing women picking up and doing things they would have never otherwise thought of doing to, to, to make money and they are sustaining the family because men are, are either dead or they are on the front line stupidly fighting whatever they are fighting. So uh, the, the economic empowerment of women is, 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 a, is, a, is a kickoff. It's a, start, it's a starting point for all other empowerment agenda for women because women who have the, min the minimum possible dignity with food on their tables and shelters over their heads, they, they can actually then move on to the other empowerment agendas like political participation and participation in the public sphere and taking charge for their own lives and then 
you know, spacing or not spacing or not having kids or having kids or sending their um, uh, children to religious schools or not religious schools. I mean, th I think the rest is just a detail more than anything else. What works? I think what works is building that sustainability mechanism into everything that you are doing at the national level and bringing women even to the peace negotiation tables make them part of the peacemaking rather than saying you know thank you very much you've been really wonderful while we fought one another now it's it's time for men in gray suits to actually strike the peace deal fascinating Arfe, did you want to mention some of your, I mean, I know that at the end of your presentation, you were talking about some of the, the you know, solutions to the challenges that you were presenting. Would you, do you, do, would you like to address some of those? Or I'm, I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot with that. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, I think uh, you're right to suggest that um, there's a possibility um, to draw from other countries' experiences, not just in the region, but um, from other uh, places, especially as far as incorporating youth in the labor force. Um, there are a set of solutions that are known. Some are directly providing employment and um, reducing the mismatch between the skills that um, the labor market needs and the, the training. But some are also more creative measures that um, could help in the absence of immediate employment for everybody. Uh, because uh, a lot of the Malays with this youth is just feeling integrated uh, in their society. And so part of it is getting a job, certainly. But while you're waiting for a job, you can think of the um, kind of opportunities that we just heard about uh, to be of service to the community, to maintain your skills, to build new skills that you didn't have, to learn how to become a better parent, as you said, you know, and, and, and maintain a family and so forth. There are a lot of initiatives that governments can um, uh, initiate and innovate on. And some countries in the broader West African region, Ghana, uh, and to some extent Nigeria, have tried some of this initiative to uh, do variants of national services. In here in the U.S., you have the Teach for America initiative. Var aspects of it can be duplicated. In Korea, for instance, I've seen very innovative ways to counter the um, um, private, the strength of the private uh, education sector by just providing these resources publicly. So the, the broad ideas are known. What is needed, I, I think, is what Samira uh, called the, the political commitment, not just to make those choices, but also a commitment to monitoring and evaluation. And what I really like about her presentation is that at each point, of the initiatives you had uh, monitoring um, uh, peace. And for me, that's going to be critical. Um, all of these um, solutions, you know, you have to be willing to tweak, to modify, to revise, to go to the drawing board, to adapt to the circumstances, and, but maintain the same, this, the same direction. So borrow, integrate, mix and match, but continually evaluate and adapt. Uh, so that's the key. Rich, would you like to? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, within the region, already uh, Ethiopia has uh, an urban population that is very close to replacement fertility. And, uh, and that's likely to happen throughout the region, that cities will, get, will be the easiest place to extend services uh, where, where uh, citizens will want to put their kids in school and, and intensify that ed their education. Those things go together. And uh, Addis works. From what I understand, I haven't been there, but people come back from Addis and they say, there's a city in the Sahel region that, that, that worked quite well. And um, I can't help but think that uh, when there's uh, cohort sizes going into school that are not growing, uh, and when uh, and when there's a bulge in workers and people investing in the kids, that, that, that somehow contributes to the fact that Addis is functioning. Uh, the Sahel has a, an extraordinary, like Ethiopia, has an extraordinary, div extraordinarily diverse population within each of these countries because of the, the way the borders were arranged and just because of the diversity of the Sahel itself. Um, so this is a big challenge. And when I think of of countries that actually extended services fairly well across the large group of ethnic groups, uh, many of them rural, as the Sahel is, mostly rural. 
uh, and actually got to women, had services that were put in place by women. I come up with Iran, actually one that people don't know a lot about because we weren't, uh, USAID wasn't a donor, but, but, but it did it on itself and, and uh, on its own means and, and, um, and created quite a, uh, an interesting model which is worth investigating and in a Muslim country. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, which was, uh, or, where there was USAID uh, and other donor uh, assistance for a long time, also employed traditional uh, caregivers and midwives, which is a model for uh, the Sahel as well, because these populations, some of them are transhuman, some of them are in, spread out across the, uh, large expanses of territory, uh, it's very, going to be very difficult to extend services in an efficient way without some kind of on-the-ground service provider that is already there and knows the population. Yeah, fascinating. Um, and, and Sonny, feel free to, to um, answer that first question or, or speak to that first question as well, but uh, I would also love to hear, I mean, you were talking about um, youth kind of being shut out of the actual policy level discussions by people saying they were too young to be be there. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I mean, again, I, I, I am curious because we hear, you know, so often and, and rightly so to focus on young women and keeping the young girls in school because of the, you know, the demographic effect of that. Um, but curious, you know, I'm curious where the young men fall into, into, into place here in the solutions part of this um, discussion and, and your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I want to just say something about this issue because uh, last year after my um, fellowship year in the University of California in Berkeley, I did some courses in public policy. So my project is to see, uh, to talk about, to have a public policy in teenage pregnancy because actually in my country is the, the main issue, teenage pr pregnancy and early marriage. So when I analyzed things, I, I realized that in my country we don't have a public policy in this issue. So we try to see if it's possible to have uh, one. That's another big challenge because last year when the government, uh, the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs organized a national, I think the second national forum on population development, we have uh, a lot of problem with uh, religious leaders and traditional leaders according to, to the, some recommendation. Because as young, we participate in this process, and we say that is not, we, we should uh, serve uh, young ladies that are in school area. We should uh, maybe limit the age for the marriage, and also how can they use the contraceptive uh, uh, means. So that's in a big problem, because every time when you decided to have some uh, policy on this issue, you have uh, those traditional uh, leaders and religious leaders that say no, they are not agree or is not conform according to the religion or to the tradition. It's a big barrier and people still talking uh, or saying things uh, for, with you, for youth, but not asking uh, youth uh, what they think. You see, every time they decided uh, of, uh, in our place, but we are always absent. So, but now we're trying to have a new kind of young leader that try to show them and also to show that they have skills. Because in the past they said you are too young because you don't, uh, you don't, you don't finish, you didn't finish your study or you don't have skills. But now uh, many, many, many young people uh, have a degree and a study and know very well things that uh, they can do. So I, I think the, uh, that's a, a good idea to have a, a policy on many, in many issues. But it is not uh, just to have to, or to adopt a public policy in different areas. So how can we implement them? That's a problem also in Africa and in Sahel. You have some uh, many framework, many document that was adopted or some law, but the implementation uh, is a big problem. It's a big deal there. So. What can you do? As young people, we must lead this change positively. I think we have this capacity. We have also this, uh, we have the knowledge to change it. But sometimes not so easy. It's not so easy, but we are trying to mobilize them. Maybe in a few time, we can, uh, things can be changed. But I think really to, to when people try to have some, some project, so to see how can they implement it. But see, just last, last night I'm talking with someone, I say, in Africa it's not about project, it's about the way, it's about the result and the impact of the project. When you see, when you hear about the money that's given by the donor to our country or that invest in the Sahel, but nothing can have it real in, real in the community, at community level. 
that's so sad, but that's the reality also. So I think we must do things, we must change things there. Uh, let's open up the questions to the to the room, and I think what we'll do is um, it seemed to work um, for the last session. Take about three questions, um, and if you have, uh, please uh, tell us who you are, and um, and if you have a specific panelist that you're addressing the question to, uh, say that as well. Um, let's see. This is where I'm. Let's go with uh, with you first, and then uh, we'll go right in the middle, and then right there, and then I'll, I'll go out from there. Thank you very much. My name, my name is Hassan. Um, I'm from um, Arise TV uh, News. Uh, my question goes to uh, Sani Ayu, and perhaps I will appreciate at some point if uh, uh, Samira from the World Bank will also uh, come in with the uh, policy uh, aspect of it. So you've um, taken us through a fantastic energy saving you know, model. I mean, the rice husk, which is being used in the, um, but uh, if I may ask, how do you sustain the value chain? Do you have an agribusiness um, as a backbone that fits into it? And if, um, if that model should be applied, I mean, through sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Mr. Mira, how do you see the prospect in terms of climatic, uh, you know, uh, I mean, regulating uh, climate change activities. I mean, t activities that you know that are good. Um, for the you know, right, yeah. I mean, best practices for you know regulating uh, climate uh, climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go, can we go right in the middle? Um, the woman in with the white coat. Sure. Uh, my name is Barbara, a uh, student. My first question goes to uh, Samira, and the next question will go to Parfait if I have time. If not, then I can come back later. Uh, uh, Samira, um, the theme that has been running throughout, I think, this discussion has been, a lot of it has had to do you know, with the low status of women. And I just wanted to get your take on what you think about all these powerful ideas that come from um, very powerful medical and public health establishments from the West, for example, the project you are doing, to what extent can you see the success of those projects? If we are seeing that you know, a lot of these particular women on whom is impacting, they are not actually involved in the, in the, like in the um, germination of the project, like the discussions of what they want. I have, been, I have seen for a number of um, times a lot of projects coming in and even if these women you know like okay they are rural women they don't understand a lot of things but i have I, I know that they have a lot of knowledge and participation that they can bring to the project and their participation and decision making in what they want and the services they want to be provided for them can actually you know contribute to the success of the project uh, that's one part of the question the second part of the question is I also would like to know to what extent, you know, somebody like you who is running this project, uh, you, uh, the extent to which you were involved, you know, in the decision making of, you know, how this project is going to take off because you said you just walked into the project. So uh, I, I will, I can come back to Pafi some other time. Okay, and then did you have a, uh, right there in front. Hello, Michelle McKenzie, U.S. African Development Foundation, and my comment is directed to Sani. Um, I was a former Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, in Zendir, mm. and actually I did a lot of work very similar to the work that you're doing now, where I developed a curriculum, both a formal and an informal version, that ties together the connection between population growth, the environment, status of women, and link it all to the development potential of Niger that I was implementing in um, secondary schools in Niger through the secondary school inspection. Um, so I wanted to know, do you work with um, peer educators when you go around and do your caravans? Because if so, there was already a trained group of peer educators who are very informed, uh, very well trained foot soldiers that were already in the ground. The curriculum is there and I'm sure it's under layers and layers of dust by now because no one's <laughs> been using it since I've left. So. Um, um, do you know Halima Dura? 
Okay. Yeah, we worked together. Okay. We discussed that last year when she was an intern in our office for Yali. So maybe we could discuss a little bit afterwards do you do work that you're doing now and what I was doing then and see how you can incorporate some of that into your current work. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, Sani, why don't you address the, the, the first question from, it was Hassan? Um, he, he was asking about the, um, the how do you sustain the value chain of these um, rice husk stoves, which is, which is uh, I think, a, a, a very valid question because a lot of times you have these programs that go in and, you know, to reach self, a self-sustaining model just becomes, they, they just kind of go apart once, the, the fall apart once the, pro, the funding um, evaporates. Um, so, so, yeah, how do you sustain that value chain? And then we'll go to uh, the question for Samira. Yeah. I think uh, the program, uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, the, the program is like, like I say, is a, a program for the Netherlands Development Organization. So the, the project is for two years, last year and this year. This year, the, uh, the, fund, the fund finished, the, uh, finished this year. It's a regional program also that uh, gathered together four countries, Ghana, ba uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. So in Niger, they are focused on household and also this rice husk. But the first thing that we are trying to do this year is to see how the government of Niger can put this in the national program of, uh, uh, the national program of energy alternative of wood. So we already see, uh, we, uh, we work with them, and actually they agree to put it in the alternative of wood wood energy. So and, uh, the other thing is so for this uh, Netherlands organization is to find a uh, find, uh, fund for maybe the next two years or so for the project. But that's, that's the point that we are. But we are happy to see that the government is accepted. The, the, the Ministry of, of Energy accepted to make it in the national policy, the national program. And now actually some local, like I show in the picture, some, uh, we have so many projects that try to finance climate change uh, resilience at community level. So we try to see if them is possible for them to buy this kind of co cooking stuff for women in their uh, locality. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, and then Samira, we'll go to you uh, with the the idea. I think the the question was how do you uh, how do you incorporate the prospects of of climate change into the work that you do? Um, and then maybe if you could just uh, continue on with um, Barbara's question, which was I think very valid in the sense that a lot of these models come in from Western agencies, um, and their you know the germination stage is is outside of the communities. And how do you you know is there a model for incorporating some of the ideas of the the, the women who are the on the receiving end of these communities? It's definitely you know as as is in in my reporting, I've seen some of the most self sustaining programs are the ones that that incorporate the communities in on 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 a on a very um, significant level. So sure. Um, there is a huge gender component into the climate change discussion. There's no question about it from fumes and fuels and women are left behind in the shacks and homes cooking, etc., etc. So um, there is, and, and I can speak uh, f uh, on sort of both sides of the aisle, the UN and the bank, because I've, I've been to both. Uh, um, uh, there is a special focus on sustain, sustain, sustainability of um, uh, economic empowerment projects that are t they take into consideration the, c the climate change and the environment. And the best example that comes to my mind, because what we used to do, uh, we used to hold an expo, um, we call it South to South Expo, where our projects are sort of um, shared and in a, in a storytelling um, in a storytelling format, like you know, it's uh, it's 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 an exposition whereby you uh, you show what you're doing, and one of them that picked up very very quickly and it became you know, it it was on a snowballing uh, path is is something called the solar mamas, and that's women who are putting together very simple apparatus for producing solar energy of course in 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 some abundance uh, countries and that that had started in jordan actually and then very quickly picked up and and then it was picked up by a company that actually sort of you know had a, a small firm for those women to to um, make and monitor their projects so um, if done right there has to be a lot of attention uh, given to not just the climate change but all the development milestones that we are dealing with you know education nutrition climate change of course is one of them and an important one of them 
Um, the I, I I agree with you on the on the um, the foreign agencies coming in and doing what they're doing almost surgically and then leaving. The bank is a bit better than that, and not just because the bank puts food on my table, because I genuinely um, believe in this. The, uh, the current project took 20 months in preparation. We had country consultations at an average of five consultations per country. And those consultations involved the government, of course, because this is IDA money. There has to be a formal request that's coming from the government. This is how the bank works, and no one can change this. But at the same time, we've had consultations with civil society organizations, with women groups, with youth groups, with other stakeholders, um, educators, academia. And all of these are actually available, because if you look at the PAD, which is the project approval document, uh, it's something like, I think it's close to 300 pages long, and it does list all of those groups that were consulted. I walked right into it because I wasn't in a, on an external service agreement to, to another UN agency, and I came back in January, and it so happened that this, this is actually my commodity. This is what I do for a living. I do reproductive health policy, and uh, the, the, the bank saw that this is, and I used to lead this kind of work three years ago before I left to UN Women. So um, uh, there, there was a lot of groundwork that was happening, and this is one of the things that the international community, the bank included, is because more and more aware of uh, that's that notion of teach someone how to fish and don't give them a fish um, this is why the there is a heavy emphasis in the project of creating regional hubs for knowledge sharing of creating regional observatories and country specific mechanisms by which when the project ends which is a five years from January this year you would have at least left some knowledge of how to rather than just doing what, and, and that is something that was done by the international community before. I mean, there's an abundance of literature. I am not about to defend the guilty here. So there was a lot of preparations, and I'm really quite comfortable to say that probably everyone who ever is going to be a beneficiary or anyone who is ever going to be an effective partner into that project had been consulted. Thank you. Thanks, Samira. The, 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 um, the Solar Mamas uh, example, I think, is a good one. I just, um, I, in the next couple of weeks, I'll have a story coming out about the, that project in uh, Zanzibar, where, um, it, so it's addressing the climate aspect of, of energy. It's addressing the, the, the huge challenge for Af Africa, which is access to energy. Uh, but it's also mm -hmm. transforming the role of women in a, a Muslim society, which is Zanzibar in a, a very powerful way. This was a five thousand dollars grant. Yeah, I mean, this is this is pennies yeah, compared is. to, <laughs> and in yeah. and in Zanzibar, the government has actually allocated the 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 highest amount of their of their development budget for this project because they see the promise um, in in uh, women's livelihoods and and the the role that it's playing. Um, really powerful stuff. Um, uh, let's uh, let's go to more questions. Um, uh, maybe if, if somebody has a question for Parfait or Rich, um, let's go uh, there and then there. And then. Thank you, Brian Greenberg with Interaction. I wanted first to thank the panelists for raising so many interesting issues for us to ponder. I had a question first for Parfait. Uh, and you may, uh, in your head, have addressed it, but one of the things that was a little bit unclear to me in your, in your nice uh, linking of demographic change and, uh, and structures and inequality and the relationship to violence was whether it's potentially useful to disaggregate or differentiate the kinds of violence um, which are at play here and which I, I may have totally misunderstood, but it seemed to me that violence was kind of a composite category at the end uh, and that we might be able to, f for example, just the kinds of violence we've heard about today, interstate violence, ethnic, communal, religious, tribal violence, uh, resource-based competition, um, ordinary crime, sort of urban crime, and then, and then importantly, violence against women. So that we might expect different uh, effects and outcomes with each of those kind of, kind of miss the, the nuanced if we just group them as violence. Samira, you nicely uh, tried to push on the accountability issue 
uh, and indicated that you wanted to you wanted to track spending as a, a, an aspect of accountability, and that's of course very worthy. But I'm wondering if there's a way to push the accountability more toward the outcome level because the resources are very much an input side of things issue. They can go into the wrong kinds of activities or the right kind of activity but mismatch to the problem and so forth. So if we push the accountability downstream, it might be more revealing. But for accountability to work, you certainly need all kinds of judicial and oversight mechanisms and freedom for civil society operating space, which is not uh, available in many of these same countries. So how do we get around that? And then just very quickly, Sonny, I appreciated um, your focus on gender. And I wondered if you have explicitly drawn on the alternative masculinities discourse to develop some of this because there was, and again I may have misunderstood, there was a sense in which uh, the assumption was that young men under certain conditions will resort to violence uh, as an outcome. But importantly, there might be other culturally specific forms of masculinity which would not have the same response pathways built in and that if we could influence those versions of masculinities we could we could get beyond the kinds of traditional equation of male maturity and uh, agency as related to violence because they have all kinds of negative influences on men. It's not just women. Men shorten their lives. They give themselves PTSD for life. All kinds of negative outcomes that can, that can be gotten around. So thank you. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, right there. Hi, Maria Posey, IRD. Um, I have a question for the academics, uh, so parfait and rich. Um, I'd actually like a little bit more clarification on your um, original um, co correlation causation assumptions. Um, because parfait, um, I feel like your assumption about inequality and violence um, and it seems like you cut out some slides from your presentation and maybe it was explained there. But is it, I feel like in the, in the global setting, is it a chicken and an egg dilemma where um, rather than what I got the sense from you, inequality leading to violence, you would have peace and then that would, that would um, encourage inequality you would have potentially higher education which would decrease inequality. You could have um, higher levels of GDP and income and then that would um, decrease inequality. So there are a number of potentially intervening factors there that would influence the relationship between inequality and violence. And so if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on the causal link that you were making and what kind of variables you controlled for in your study. I think that would be helpful in understanding your argument. And almost the identical question for Rich, actually, because it, without explicitly saying so, it, you were certainly implying that higher age leads to um, better probability or higher likelihood of free and liberal states. Um, I never heard you say, you know, that explicit logic, but it was certainly implied, and I think that's a pretty loaded um, assumption to make. Again, there could be a number of inter intervening variables that would affect that relationship, and you know, in a hypothetical world, world, simply increasing the age of population, you know, if you artificially could do that, I am not at all convinced that that would um, suddenly lead to free and liberal societies. So again, if you could clarify on some of those variables that you may have controlled for in those settings, um, I think it would be helpful to understand your argument and your thought process a little bit more. 
Great, thanks, Maria. I think I think at this point, let's go to the questions. Uh, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure we can get to all of these really good questions. Um, Parfait, let's start with you. Brian was suggesting, do we disaggregate the kinds of, of violence um, that that um, all of these complex factors um, lead to, um, whether it's interstate, whether it's religious, resource-based, urban violence? Um. Yeah, OK. Thanks, Brian. It's a uh, really um Crucial question. Uh, some of this that disaggregation is done in the slides that I have, but it's not complete. There are at least three types of disaggregation that can be um, imagined. One would be across levels, <laughs> as you indicated, um, and there's some of that in the uh, full set of slides. But there's another, which is about um, thinking about the different protagonists. Um, that is, where are the youth at the um, ends of this um, violence? Uh, it's actually an irony that if you have inequality, it's not always the poor sort of taking up arms against the rich. Sometimes it's violence of the poor against the poor um, or different forms that are unexpected. So you want to make a difference between that. You, have, you want to make a difference between really open violence and also low-grade violence um, that sometimes goes underreported. And uh, again, some of them are uh, easier to... Uh, document and to st therefore to study than others. Uh, there's also just a way to extend the analysis, and I think some of the conversation I heard here as well as lunchtime between just overt physical violence and other forms that are economic violence. And in, 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 in a way, it becomes tautological with um, inequality because inequality in itself can be construed as a form of economic violence. If you think about uh, things such as pr prostitution, it's a form of e economic violence. And so um, it, there's clearly a need for disaggregation, and that's why I, I wasn't making an empirical case. Uh, if I, I, I stated very clearly that um, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing here with a working hypothesis that at least plausibly we can think about some forms of inequality leading to some form of violence. And I can actually answer the uh, other question um, because it's sort of uh, the same argument. It, it's, it's really not an empirical case. Um, and you're absolutely correct that this both a cor correlation causation issue, um, which would need to be addressed in the studies that do this. You need to control for tons of stuff. You need to make sure that um, you know, violence does not necessarily come in a bundle with all th other um, um, societal ills. There's also the, um, you know, the feedback effects. Um, you know, violence itself um, can feed back into inequality. And so which comes before which, is, it's, it's, it's a tough question. Uh, and so these are questions that people who want to study this carefully uh, on an empirical footing need to address. And, le and let's have Rich uh, respond um, to that question too before we go to Samira and Sani about the, um, sure. you know, the, the um, implying that higher age levels lead to freer states and kind of the, the loadedness of It's that. loaded, that's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll try to unload it a little bit by, uh, by saying that, that I've done the work that uh, you would probably want to see, which is to test this model with income, uh, per capita in uh, educational levels but among young adults and uh, as well as age structure. And basically you could create the model with any of those three. Uh, income and uh, age structure fit the best, let's put it that way. They're the strongest, uh, pr produce the strongest um, uh, regression line and, 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 and small standard errors. Uh, education, surprisingly, is, is weaker, at least the educational variable that I used. Uh, I chose, I chose uh, age structure, um, first of all, because I'm a demographer and it lo looked very easy to do. And, and the easiness is created by uh, the fact that you can project, and the UN does this, projects age structure. Uh, and for 20 years, it's a pretty good projection. Uh, there's some that don't quite uh, live up to the median projection, but uh, by and large, you can look into the future, and that was the purpose of the model, is to look into the future and see who had a chance to make liberal democracy, who's going to make their way out of conflict, in terms of risk, that is, at least. Um, but your basic point is correct, I think, is that 
Uh, and and I sort of just repeating a bit what Parfait said is that there are extraordinary feedbacks between fertility and education going both ways. Uh, fertility, lower fertility, uh, results in higher social spending, uh, both by the state and by par parents on education. Um, that's social spending, I should say. Parents and education and the state both contribute more when the, the cohorts are smaller and the families are smaller. Um, education and income, we know, are, are very uh, tightly linked. Income feeds back into education because as income goes up, kids stay in school longer. Um, the real interesting weak link, at least in the literature right now, I think, is that is, is, is income and fertility directly. In other words, there was, I think there's a, a basic assumption in social sciences, particularly among political scientists, that it's income that drives down fertility. And really, the literature is showing that uh, that may be, but it, it's very weak and it goes on for, gen takes generations to occur. And you could look at the Arabian Peninsula and, and see how long it's taken, even though income is high. That, um, and you can look elsewhere. I mean, you can look in the developing world, the developed world, how, look at, how long it took. Uh, so it's really that income, that link between fertility, education, and income, and income, education, fertility, back the other way, that creates the powerful effect. So here's the point, is the point is you should be working on all of those three. You shouldn't wait, which was, wait to, to, to put family planning programs in the, in, into effect. You shouldn't wait for education, particularly girls' education, and you shouldn't wait to put, uh, to give people a chance to, uh, to make their own household income. Basically, it. thanks, Rich. Um, we're running low on time, but I want to get to these last two questions. So maybe Samira, if you can talk really quickly about um, creating accountability in in places where you know there's a lot of lack of accountability and the challenges. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we haven't figured out yet the accountability structure, and I agree completely that it could be you know what you've described, uh, and there isn't really a one size that fits all. One thing that I personally believe in, and I'm, I will try to push to whoever see it feasible, is this tool that's called gender responsive budgeting and planning, whereby governments think they are spending on girls' education uh, or they are spending on, um, you know, commodity security or productive health. But there has to be separate budget lines, not just because those cohorts of population are worthy of what the, what the planning is, is going to be, but it's easier to track and it's easier for the accountability mechanism. So, I, I mean, there is no argument there. Absolutely. Thank you. Right, uh, and then we'll go back to Brian's question um, to, to Sani, which I think is a very interesting one in the sense of, you know, the assumption that these that it's these young men that will resort to violence. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure which um, which cultural models you were looking at of, of you know maybe tapping into some of the of uh, ideas or or cultural um, um, examples of masculinity that's redirected in away from violence. Um, Wait, am, I, am, I, am I doing justice to your question? Um, I think you are. It's okay. been a subject for a longer conversation. Sure. But my point was that this is a cultural shift that we would be promoting. We would not simply look at violent men and say we need to uh, increase services to sure. women of some kind. Yeah. We would look to, to transform the nature of masculinities which have a violent reflex and in many ways we've got to invent those there is not a, simply a peaceful cultural model that we can adopt but we're certainly going to have to invent them all right thanks brian yeah yeah i get the point i think uh, uh, that's a good question uh, and also when i say in, uh, in my country uh, people think that is there uh, something that is that are not negotiable you see uh, like things like uh, this kind that at, uh, of uh, religion issue or traditional issue, people, for most of them, they think that uh, they don't know uh, how to change it. Or, but now actually we try to transform, we try to do our best in order to show the new thing or how people can see the things. That's why we set up, uh, since last year, we set up a, a mentorship program for young people because young people must be the leader of tomorrow. So when they are already aware about all those issues, maybe in the next few years they can change things. And also it is not, it's not very easy to, to change. 
but we are trying to see uh, and also because uh, people, uh, some people uh, say or see that it's, it's good for them to stay like this. They don't see the necessity or uh, for them it's not necessary to change. So that's the problem also. But uh, in the past, we, we don't know violence in my country. We just hear about we just hear about what now actually we are in some part of the country we are living in. So I think this kind of are trying to change the mentality and also uh, the point of view of uh, many of uh, uh, the, po the population. So I think the leader also mentioned many, we have many programs that try to involve a traditional leader and a religious leader try to involve them in order to make change together. Because it's not just a thing for young uh, people only or for women, but we're trying to make them together. I hear here someone talking about uh, the program for UNFPA that's called Ecole de Marie, Husband School. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good initiative that uh, in Zender and Miria, I know many guys that are involved inside, and now they try to, to speak and to share experience with their women or their, their wife. Because in, in the past, it was not the same. The, in the family, people don't talk about this kind of issue, sexual issue. They say, no, it's not you know, women and men can talk together with this kind of issue. But according to some project, that this kind of project are trying to, to change mentality. And we hope that if we maintain the cap, we can change things. Great. Thank you, Sonny. Okay. Um, thank you to all our panelists. That was a, a fascinating panel. And thanks to the audience for great questions. Um, we are going to take a short five minute break and then the third panel will begin um, in about five minutes. So we'll regather again here. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you again. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll watch. Are you presenting?